Sony couldn't sit by while Nintendo raked in money for making a Nintendo Classic, and so they made the PS1 Classic. We're going to take it apart today because it didn't come with the power cable, and I don't have a phone charger here. So we're going to take it apart instead of playing it. And this is, well, it's called the SCPH-1000R, and it is the PS1 remade into a box that is lighter than my phone. So you know it's going to be some quality parts in there. But to be fair, how much do you really need to play 24-year-old games? Uh, so this thing runs the PCSX emulator. Officially, it runs the PCSX rearmed emulator, which is a modified version of the PCSX reloaded emulator for ARM processors, which is a modified version of PCSX. So it's, it's got an emulator on it. It's probably running an ARM processor, given the name. We're going to take it apart and see if we can identify the components, what they do, and how good the build quality is of this, this thing. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's RTX 2080 Ti XC Ultra video card. We recently used this to beat our Founders Edition overclocking results with its additional power target headroom and cooling capabilities. The XC Ultra uses a 2.7 extra thick heatsink for quiet operation under low loads, but also maintains higher clocks on average over the FE model. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up the notes here, we're gonna take this one apart today and then we're gonna do a separate teardown of an original PS1 controller that we bought used. But the good news is it's so old that all of the uh, bacteria on here is probably dead by now. We're gonna take this apart and this apart and look at the two and see how accurate the PS1 Classics version of the original PS1 non-DualShock controller is. So we have one of each here. So we're going to do that. And you would be not at all surprised at how cheap those are these days. So we're going to do this one today. And first of all, uh, I should note that by today's standards, to obviously to produce the quality of game a PS1 runs, you really don't need much. You definitely don't need this much surface area for your parts. I mean, any modern phone is going to be more powerful than this, as evidenced by the price tag, if nothing else. And uh, so you don't need much, which means that if we kind of tap on this, you'll hear that it is pretty much hollow all the way through. So there's probably not going to be a whole lot in there for us to look at. But uh, oh, also, first thing I did was try and start taking this thing out. Looks only parallel I.O. port. And uh, apparently this is a thing that happened even on a a, an updated version of the original PS1 when they took away the I.O. port and replaced it with plastic. So that doesn't come out. But um, if we look over the thing first, your disk replica doesn't actually run them. Uh, memory card slots that don't have memory cards, but it's, it's all just for looks, right? It's all for, for posterity. And then USB controllers, which is actually much appreciated, uh, especially if you can plug them into a computer or something. And that's really all there is to it. Um, not much venting or ventilation here at all. This is all fake. So that's all just embellishments. And you can see the metal through here. So technically can vent a bit, but it's not really going to get hot. So let's take it apart. We have Phillips size zero screws to start with. And there's going to be one, two, three, four, five that are revealed. And then sometimes they like to hide one under these stickers or under these feet. So we'll see if we can, if we can find them all easily. This is a pretty easy component to take apart, but I'll track the screws on our mod, on our, our mod mat anyway, which has a video card diagram on it. Same idea though. You can get one at store.gamersnexus.net if you do like what you see, just for screw tracking, although this is five, so pretty easy. Our last two console, nice, a bunch of plastic came out with it. <laughs> our last two console teardowns were the Nintendo Switch, the Joy-Con controller teardown, which was after that, and the Xbox One X teardown. So today, like I said, we're going to do this one first, and then after we're done with this one, we'll have a separate video on the controllers comparing the old to new. Oh, that was trivial. <sighs> hey, I have an idea. Let's put holes in the bottom for ventilation and then obstruct them with a film. I mean, again, it's not... It's not really generating any heat, so who cares, I guess? I mean, it's, it's pulling less wattage than a phone does when it's under load. So you got to kind of keep that perspective. Uh, underside here, the first thing that's revealed is not much. Uh, it's a custom fit PCB. It does, in fact, take up most of the surface area. You've got a big block here that's not used, but they're not going to make a device shaped like that. So 
Uh, the PCB itself only has a couple of kind of standard caps. You find these on everything, video cards, motherboards. So small caps, smaller caps, uh, some small SMDs, and this PCB is la it's labeled side B, and then it's also uh, LM11, and I don't know if this, this is probably a PCB model number, but um, LM11, and then 9840211, Sony Interactive Entertainment Incorporated. Some solder joints on here. So these are just solder joints so, uh, where they attached the I.O. and the charging ports. Let's get to the other side. That's where the interesting stuff is. So if you took your own apart for some reason, just be advised that the screw sizes are different. They're smaller on the inside. Easiest teardown possible. I guess we want to probably separate this and it is probably secured by thermal pad. So let's go there. What's holding us down? Thermal pad. So thick thermal pad connecting to um, a, an appropriately sized, albeit, I mean, pathetic by our standards, but for this kind of device, again, the amount of heat you're dissipating is just irrelevant. It barely shows up anywhere. So there's your heat sink. No active cooling, does not need it, which is ultimately a positive. And for the components, that's where we can kind of start looking at stuff. The shell is an ABS plastic, and that's for this outer shell, that's an ABS plastic. For the inner components, these are switches. These are switches. So where do those, which buttons do those? God damn it. So you can see power button right there. So. Power button, reset button, open button, which I believe is used for like game switching or something like that. I haven't powered it on yet. Let's get rid of the thermal pad. This toolkit we're using is just from our uh, iFixit ProTech toolkit. And I will link that below if you're interested in them. Right, so there's a the thermal pad. How thick is that? That would be useful information if you needed. This is the kind of thing I could see drying up in a couple of years and needing to be replaced. So if you had issues with shutdown, thermal shutdowns, we can at least figure out the thickness of this thing. It's a two millimeter thermal pad, roughly. Any tighter and I'm gonna rip it. So that's about two millimeters. So over here we have a Samsung flash module. So this is gonna be NAND based memory. Uh, so this is your EMMC NAND flash. And we'll talk about this part in a moment as well. These two modules right here, these are DDR3 modules, and we have two of those. So this pad can come off, but it's not hiding anything. So there's no reason to remove it. That's just for mounting pressure to fit everything cleanly. Looking at the parts in more depth, starting with the two most important ones, the SOC is a MediaTek MT8167A processor that's used in some low-end and mid-range tablets like the Acer Iconia. The CPU is a 64-bit quad-core whose memory controller can communicate with DDR3, LPDDR3, and DDR4. We can show an A35 block diagram from ARM to better illustrate the architecture at a top level, though, if you need a, a refresher on that. The CPU proper is an A35 Cortex at 1.5 gigahertz, although we don't know if Sony has made any modifications to theirs. The A35 is ARM's smallest processor design and is an efficiency-focused low-power chip that has an FPU on each core, of which there are four of those, and that's alongside blocks of D-cache and I-cache. There's shared L2 cache for all cores, and although ECC is optional, it probably is not used in the PS1. And this is clearly not powerful by modern standards, but keep in mind that the original PS1 used a 33.9 megahertz 32-bit processor, RISC processor by LSI, and that company has since been bought and sold to multiple parent companies uh, in the last couple of years even. This SOC is working with PowerVR's GE8300 IGP, which is capable of about 32 FP32 flops per clock. Also not that powerful, but the original PS1 had a max resolution of 640 by 480, <laughs> and a flat shading poly throughput of 360,000 polygons per second, which actually isn't bad, but it goes down to 180,000 polys per second 
when you texture map them, and it goes down to 90,000 when you add lighting to the texture mapping and shading. This worked alongside a geometry coprocessor for the original PS1 for vector math and matrix multiplies. It also had two kilobytes, two KB of texture cache that operated at 132 megabytes per second on, uh, on the memory bus, which was 32 bits. So it's a 32-bit wide memory interface, 132 megabytes per second. Just, just for perspective, modern memory interfaces are in the hundreds of gigabytes per second. As for the, and that's for something like a high-end GPU. As for the EMMC, that's Samsung's, and it's the KLMAG1JETD-B041. We got a hold of the data sheet for this one, and we found that its density is 16 gigabytes. There's one of these modules on the board. Unfortunately, pricing was difficult to get because it's an EOL part. So while we found prices, they were all hyperinflated due to the lack of availability. And uh, Sony certainly got better prices than we could find online, so it's not even worth listing the prices we found. Just, just they're not accurate at all. Next, the DDR3 is Samsung's K4B4G1646E-BYMA, which is an 1866 megabit per second, 4 gigabit memory solution organized in 8 by 512 clusters and operating at 1.35 volts. These seem to cost about 10 cents each for a few thousand units, but pricing, again, is difficult to ascertain because these chips, too, are EOL. For reference, the original PS1 used 2 megabytes of RAM and 1 megabyte of video RAM. That covers the PCB and all the components in depth. And then finally, the shell here is pretty straightforward. ABS plastic. You can see the uh, almost cherry style plus sign for the actuating switch. All that does is push down on the gold switch that you see right here. You can push it with your finger too. And it's uh, just a spring button. And that's, that is all there is to the plastic shell. There's nothing else special about that. Underside, it's just an underside and then some metal sheets to, that are on, actually attached to plastic, not to the, uh, onto the, a clear sheet of plastic rather than the casing. So that's just to cover up the holes. I don't know if that's probably more for looks than anything because thermally it shouldn't really matter all that much. That's the PS1 Classic. So the sum of its some of its parts isn't particularly high. I mean, those components are mostly EOL. So Sony probably got them from a supplier who just had a ton of them left over, trying to get rid of them, or already had a bunch on their own. Uh, as a product, we obviously don't have any opinions yet on how good of a gaming experience it is if you wanted to revisit stuff. We do have content coming up on that. So we will be soon talking about the value of this. It's kind of kind of really uh, minimizing when, when you're holding up this and knowing that you could actually just use this to play the games. I don't need to reassemble it. You can just plug it in and it would work fine. So this, we will be revisiting. Is it worth uh, buying one of these and playing the old games on it or going some other route? So make sure you subscribe for that. But otherwise, some of the parts, they're not expensive. Sony has some pretty good margin here, um, especially because it does seem like a rather hacked together last minute project. They could have done a lot of really cool things with this, uh, and we'll talk about all of that in a separate video. So that's it for the teardown, though. So uh, next thing you need to do is subscribe, check back for the controller disassembly and comparison against the original. So we're going to look for, in this one, it's, a, it's more of a field test. It's a mechanical thing. So from a human factor standpoint, how well have they replicated the feel of using the old original controller with these replicas, because that is an important characteristic for any kind of retro console remake. And that'll be it for this one. So subscribe as always for more store.cameratexas.net to pick up a mod mat like the one we used in this video or the shirt that I'm wearing now, except not literally this one. And I'll see you all next time.